All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today here in the SafeGraph community. Really excited to be back with another community event with uh, none other than the data wizard himself, Alon Rich from uh, the SafeGraph product team. So I'm uh, going to just get things started with some uh, opening items. Really just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware of another event that we're running next week um, that you'll be you'll want to be sure to come and check out if you're uh, if you're able to. So um, next week, we have a, a session enhancing enterprise analytics with foot traffic data. Uh, tune into a technical one webinar led by the SafeGraph product team to learn how mobility data provides detailed insights that fuel the most accurate trade area analyses, competitive intelligence, site selection, and more. So that event will be taking place November 10th, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern for, or I'm sorry, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, next week on November 10th, and I will be sure to drop the uh, registration link uh, here in the chat momentarily. Um, otherwise, uh, I think that's kind of everything from my end. Uh, just another thing to, to keep in mind as we kind of progress through this session, uh, we'll have plenty of time at the end for any questions that, you, uh, that the audience might have. So feel free to drop those in the chat uh, or the Q&A um, or, or raise your hand and I'll be sure to kind of keep an eye out on those. But um, I will go ahead and introduce our guest speaker for today. So. Uh, Alon is a solutions data architect on the product team at SafeGraph, primarily focused on customer ingestion and evaluation issues and joining external data sets to the place's product. Alon has previously held data architecture positions and graduated from Johns Hopkins University with a degree in applied mathematics and statistics. So uh, thanks so much for hopping on. Alon, I will go ahead and turn my camera off and pass things off to you. Great. Thanks, Nikki. I'm going to share my screen. So let's see. Hi, everyone. So um, as Nikki said, my name is Alon Rich. I'm a solutions data architect on the product team at SafeGraph. So I work internally with our go to market team and externally with customers to understand issues customers are having interacting with their data set. And I investigate and build resources to improve the experience. Today, I'll be talking about joining point of interest or POI data sets. Um, this is a really, really difficult problem and one that safe uh, the one at SafeGraph we face daily. Internally, we are always looking to onboard new sources to improve our product and accurately joining these data sets to ours is essential. Externally, customers who purchase our data may often want to join it to their data sets. Um, and so creating a seamless experience ensures that the customers can get the most out of SafeGraph data. So today I'll give a brief intro to SafeGraph and POI data sets, talk about the nuances and difficulties with working and joining POI data some best practices used at SafeGraph when we look to join data sets. And then I'll open up the webinar to a Q&A and open discussion. So to start off, what, what is a POI data set? At SafeGraph, we define a POI as any location humans can visit with the exception of single family homes. A POI data set is a very general term. Any data set that contains some combination of a location name, address, postal code, latitude and longitude constitutes a POI data set. These data sets can really explain anything about the place. There are property information data sets that describe attributes about a place. If the POI is a business, the data set might contain information about the revenue and foot traffic of that location. In healthcare, a POI data set could just contain a list of physicians and the addresses at which they practice. Um, so below on the screen is a sample of SafeGraph Core Places data set. Um, and it contains address information about Starbucks in the US. So we have a lot of the features that I spoke about um, of a POI data set. A quick background on SafeGraph. So in short, SafeGraph is a company that creates POI data sets. Um, we cu currently have data on over 10 million POI, and this data includes a combination of core business information, polygons, which are the building footprints of the POI, and foot traffic data. We have recently gone global and started to track global brands, but we do not at the moment have polygons or foot traffic globally, only in, the, only in Canada and the US. So why is this a challenge? On this slide, I present two POI data sets. If I wanted to join these two data sets on name, address, city, region, and zip code, these two records would not end up being joined. Data set two looks to, be relative, looks to be a relatively clean data set, but almost every field is different. Name includes a corporation suffix. Street is not abbreviated. Rhode Island is not shortened, and the zip code has nine digits. Um, in practice, though, we often are not joining two clean data sets. Usually things look more like this. These two data sets might contain information about the same POI, but joining them together would be really difficult. The name of the POI is the policyholder's name, not the location name of the business. 
Many data sets using insurance track POI using the policyholder name. The address looks to be misspelled in one of them, unclear which one. And some fields are missing and the zip code was probably ingested as an integer and not a string. It's the leading zero of the zip code was dropped. When working with POI data, it can also be the case that a point can be described in more than one way. This example shows two data sets that contain information about the same POI. They use a different city name, but everything else is identical. In fact, neither data set may be wrong. In this case, Addison is a suburb, is a suburb of Dallas located 15 miles from the city center. It is not uncommon to see data sets use the city name and the suburb name interchangeably. For this reason, city is not actually a good column to use when matching data. One additional metric that I haven't mentioned yet that can be used in POI matching is categorization information about the POI. At SafeGraph, we categorize all of our POI with codes from the North American Industry Classification System, or NAICS. NAICS codes are assigned by hand for branded POI and assigned by a machine learning model for non-branded POI. The system is hierarchical, and the more digits added, the more specific the description of the POI. We see 7.2 applies to all food service or accommodation place, places, which is a very broad categorization, but 721110 is just hotels. Um, these codes are really useful for picking the correct POI in cases where multiple POI can have the same or similar address. So though it's good to use the codes to improve matching, they also present their own nuances. In this example, I am trying to match two data sets for a dessert business I opened. The two data sets both have my business name listed, but their category description is completely different. When you dig deeper into them, you find that they describe something very similar. The first is an establishment primarily engaged in retailing baked goods not for immediate consumption and not made on the premises. The second is an establishment primarily engaged in retailing bread and other bakery products not for immediate consumption, made on the premises from flour, not from prepared dough, very specific. Neither data set appears to be wrong. And this is an example, and this example is extreme, but it sure to show that the NAICS codes um, are imperfect, but any type of categorization can improve the confidence in match results, but probably shouldn't be used as a join key. So now into the best practices that I use when joining data sets at SafeGraph. My approach to matching POI data sets involves optimizing a similarity metric that compares location name, street address, and uses NAICS codes Depending on the data set, different weights and fields are calculated to optimize the similarity. Before I start, I quickly want to mention two distance metrics I will talk about later. The first is Levenstein distance, which is the minimum number of insertions, deletions, or substitutions required to change one string into another. Below is an example of these three operations. So kitten to sit in, night to knit, sit in to sitting, um, all of these examples would increase the distance by one. They all involve either a insertion, deletion, or substitution. The next metric is Haversine distance, which is the shortest distance on a sphere between two points given their respective latitude and longitude. The formula is looks kind of crazy. It's not so important. Um, and there's a ton of documentation online to write this formula in languages like Python. But I'll mention the distance, Haversine distance later. And when I do, I'll be referring to distance in meters between two um, points given by it with latitude and longitude. So the first step in this process is cleaning and standardizing address fields. To both data sets I'm matching on, I will remove all punctuation from the location name strings. I've also created a list of common prefixes and suffixes that are often used to describe businesses. These include company, corporation, LLC. I remove these. Next, to standardize address strings, we have created a dictionary of common address, address suffixes that we can convert to their abbreviations. So these include things like street, which becomes ST, road, RD, parkway, PKWY. Oftentimes you'll see west or north, and we'll convert that to W or N. So the next metric we want to see if we can standardize is postal code. So I gave an example before where the leading zero was chopped off. So in that type of situation, what you want to do is go in and add a zero at the beginning. If you want to use only five digit zip codes and not nine digits, sometimes you'll see five dash four, you can go and just chop off the final four just so you're comparing five digit zip codes to five digit zip codes. So below, if we look at an earlier example using the Starbucks in Providence, um, this will show how my standardizing procedure will change some of the metrics. 
Um, and also note that we're not removing the city field, but we won't be using it to inform our match because of nuances observed earlier. Once standardized, we want to join our data sets to get all possible matches. This is done to try and get all POI matched to all POI located on the same street before we determine the best match. We can't compare all rows in both data sets to each other because it becomes too computationally expensive to cross join the data sets. So this join allows us to limit how many rows we compare to each other. I usually require the postal code and street address in this join. At SafeGraph, we also separate the street number and street name so we can try and match a POI with all POI located on that same street. You can do this by first removing any words from our dictionary from the um, street address string, so like west or street. If the string starts with a number, that's the street number, and the rest of the string is usually the street name. Finally, um, we want to account for street misspellings in either of the two data sets. So we'll take the Levenstein distance between these two street names and join the data when that distance is less than a certain threshold. Um, you can kind of play around with that. Maybe you pick 10. Um, in this example below, we have two streets, Angel and Agnel. The distance is three because you'll have to substitute the N, substitute the G, and delete the L to get the two strings to be identical. So in this situation, if you had two data sets, one with Angel and Agnel, they would join if they were in the same postal code. I'm going to take a quick detour to show that this initial join is country specific. So this is a, a two POI that are being compared that are both located in Great Britain. Um, the map is kind of small, but they're actually located half a mile from each other. So they have different postal codes. Um, so if matching POI in Great Britain, you might want to even use a more of a subset of postal code. Instead of five we use in the US, you might want to chop off the D and the G at the end if you want to compare the POI to each other. Also, it's important to notice that both addresses do not contain street numbers. So the whole isolation of street numbers might not work as well in countries like, um, in regions like Great Britain. The next step is to find the best match from all possible matches. We do this by calculating similarity scores. At SafeGraph, we define the similarity as the ratio of the distance over the length of the longer string. First, we calculate the location name score by comparing all pairs of location names in our initial join. Each pair will be given a similarity score and the highest similarity is our best matching POI by location name. Next, we calculate the address score. From the previous example with Angel and Agnel, this score would be 0.5. The distance is three and the length of the longer string is six. Um, let's say that you want a score of 100% to be perfect. You can just subtract one from that distance. And so the score would still be 0.5, but um, if the, there's the distance between the two strings is zero, you subtract one, then you have 100% similarity. So then to find the best match, you can take a weighted average of these two scores. I usually weight the street address higher as I think it's more important to say this, this is an identical location. Um, I've also seen that business names can vary a lot. So usually I weight street address higher. This can be adjusted based on the specific data set though. If you're really, really confident about the location name, maybe you're going to weight that higher. Uh, but so usually I might say 30% location name, 70% street address, but you can really play around with that and see what works. If included, if included, you can also use other data set, uh, other metadata to inform match. If using street number, I will create a metric that finds the closest building on that block. I do this by subtracting pairs of street numbers, and if the value is less than 100, I'll subtract one. I'll subtract one, divide the absolute value of the difference by 100. So for example, if the street numbers were 10 and 9, 10 minus 9 equals 1, 1 over 100 is 0.01, and 1 minus 0.01 is 99. So the street number score would be 99%, which is basically saying that this, the buildings are next to each other or across the street from each other. If the street numbers are identical, the value will be 100. It would be 10 minus 10 over 100. So 1 minus 0 is 100. If the NAICS codes are related, I will improve the previously calculated similarity score by a small amount, maybe 0.01 or 0.05. This will be important if two POI are located at the same location and they might have the same similarity score. Um, using the NAICS categorization and saying that they are in the same category and increasing it by just a small amount, 0.01 will push it over the edge. So when you pick the 
maximum similarity, you'll ensuring that you're picking the one in the same category. So in this situation, we have two NAICs that the last two digits are different, but we might say, okay, the first four are the same. As I said, it's hierarchical. They're probably in the same category. We'll say we'll increase our similarity metric. Finally, if latitude and longitude are included in your data sets, you can calculate the Haversine distance between the pairs of points and join all POI within 50 to 100 meters of the POI you were trying to match, and then calculate all the similar similarity metrics from there. So let's look at this in action. So if we revisit some previous examples, these two pair of POI that we're trying to match after being cleaned will have a perfect similarity. Their street name similarity is 100%, location name similarity is 100%, and the street number closeness is also 100%. So if you're comparing data set one to a bunch of POI and data set two, this one will win out because it has the highest similarity scores in the categories of interest. If we look at the messier data, we see that although the location name doesn't match at all, and the address is slightly different, we may choose this as the best match because they're located very close to one another. And the NAICS code tells us that they're both snack and alcoholic beverage bars. And the street name similarity is relatively high. It's not 100%, it's 83%, but it's relatively high. The final thing I wanna mention before opening this up to discussion is PlaySki. Um, founded by SafeGraph, PlaySki is an open source universal identifier for places. PlaySki incorporates Uber's H3 hexagonal grid system to convert address fields into a key. SafeGraph maintains the PlaySki API, which is free to use, and you can basically send in your different address lines and you'll get returned to a PlaySki. This is an example of a PlaySki. You have your what, which is your address information and your POI name information and at where, and the where is the actual hexagon that it belongs to. So PlaySki does some data cleaning on its own, but I'd still recommend standardizing the data before entering it into the API just to be safe. If we revisit the first example, the API actually returns the same place key and you don't actually have to create any similarity metrics. You can then join the data sets on the place key columns. Place key is still dependent though on what is input. If we revisit the example where the data is messier, even after cleaning, place key returns only the same where portion this is because the address entered is different and the location name does not match. So when working with messier data, I'd still recommend creating the similarity metrics when you're joining the two data sets. This concludes my presentation. Um, thank you for listening and I'll open up the floor to questions and comments. Awesome, thanks Alon. Um, I think we have a handful of questions. I realized I didn't uh, share the event information for next week, so I just dropped that in the chat, but. Uh, we will just kind of work through the top from um, these questions that people have submitted. So first question, uh, have validity metrics been calculated for these best practices with particular data sets or thresholds? Can you clarify what you mean by validity metrics? Let me see, uh, Mackenzie, let me allow you to talk if uh, you're able to unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Yeah, so I was thinking about um, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. I'm an epi <laughs> epidemiologist, sorry, and thinking in those terms, but um, I also realize that this is way better than a lot of our traditional methods of matching because it's so automated. So um, I'm sure if those measures have been calculated yet. Yeah, so it's actually really, really difficult to calculate these because um, so you can obviously just return anything that's 100 percent similarity and then you're sure, OK, we're saying it's matching on street address. We're saying that it's matching on location name um, and the possibility of a false match is probably low in that case. It gets a little hairier when you go down the similarity scores. Um, we've returned data to customers with a similarity score of 33% when you weight uh, location name and street address. And we, it turned out that that actually was the correct match because the data was so misspelled on their end. And so it's really difficult because the quality of the data coming in is not uh, standardized and it's kind of suspect sometimes. And so it's hard to tell what the cutoff is. Y usually, so yeah, so the answer, the short, uh, short answer is we have not calculated the, belt, the validity metrics and it is a standardized process. Usually anything above your street address threshold. So if you set your street address to be 70%, anything above that 
is usually pretty safe. At least we're saying that the street addresses are exact match. Maybe the location names are different. Um, this can also happen if the building has changed ownership. So we were matching a data set. We um, got sent in Rite Aid and we matched it to a Dollar Tree at the same location. I went and I looked up that Rite Aid and it, there was an article that said that it had recently crossed over to a Dollar Tree. So that's one that would probably be seen as a miss, but when you actually dig deeper, you find out that the, it was the correct match. So it's a really, really difficult to, to create full entity metrics. Awesome, thanks Alon. Um, yeah, another another really good question coming in. Um, does the match service offered by SafeGraph on its website use the same methodologies explained in this presentation? So it uses some of the same methodologies. Um, we're actually in the process of revamping the match service um, to incorporate some of these. This um, has been kind of an exercise since I joined SafeGraph that I've undertaken because we have a lot of customers coming in with messy data. And so I've been trying to see what works and what doesn't. Um, and on my learning, I've discovered things like the NAICS code example I showed where the two NAICS codes were completely different and the city example where two cities can actually refer to the same place. So we're sitting down now as a team and we're trying to revamp our match service to take some of these learnings and improve that whole customer experience. Very good. Um, another question. When matching multiple data sets with three different addresses, which address is chosen as the best or correct address? So you're matching, I guess I would like clarification. You're trying to match three data sets up. Um, yeah, let's see uh, if I will allow this individual to speak. All right, Hi go guys. ahead. I was just uh, cause like, when you have duplicates within a data set and you try and match, so you will have you know three different data sets and none of them are the correct address like how do you guys determine which one is the correct address yeah so it's as i said it's a difficult issue that's when we kind of rely on some metadata so you incorporate some metadata like the NAICS code um, or any type of categorization and then you can determine what the most likely match is when you're when you're joining in this way the, the place key is really, really simple because if you have the same place key, you know it's the same place. When you're joining on messy data to clean data or messy data to messy data, there's not really a way to determine that this is 100% the correct match. It's just the most likely. And so that often happens when you say, okay, we have the exact same street name after cleaning. We have the exact same location name after cleaning. And the next code is maybe at least at next two. It's like at the top level, it's the same category. We're going to say that this is the correct uh, match of all the possible um, options with this with this match process you're basically trying to determine the most likely match it's not a perfect science you're going to have some misses but you're trying to determine using all the metadata provided what is the most likely match across the two data sets awesome um, i think we have one other question that's actually uh, was surfaced in the safecraft community before for this event so i wanted to make sure to ask um, so for, for individuals that might have previously downloaded data prior to SafeGraph place ID being uh, retired and then possibly downloading data with only place keys after, after that backfill, um, is there a good approach for matching these two? Um, SafeGraph place ID to place key. Correct. So do you, I guess if you have, well, you could basically run the same process that I ran on the two data sets to get a um, bridge between SafeGraph place ID and place key. So everything that I spoke about, you can just take the two data sets. Hopefully the street address location and fields haven't changed that much. We also have a lineage API, which tracks how place keys have changed over time if things about the address get updated. So maybe the place stays the same, but the address gets updated so the place key changes. We have a lineage API that tracks changes to that. So if you do some of the match procedures that I talked about in this webinar to get the bridge between SafeGraph place ID and place key, then you can track changes to place key over time so you can continue that bridge. Um, yeah, and I guess always come to us and see if we can help provide any other um, solutions to pull bridges for you if you're having some issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Another thing that I'll plug is we have a help and support channel in our SafeGraph community uh, for any other questions uh, if they come up after this session as well. So always feel free to uh, reach out if you have any questions. Um, 
had one other question, actually a few more uh, come through. So um, actually I, I saw that Adam had posted a question um, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit outside maybe the scope of this conversation. So I'm happy to connect with you offline uh, and we can uh, handle that separately. Um, I wanna say one thing about the match service. Um, if any of you on the webinar have interacted with it and you've had um, any type of experience, we'd, we'd really appreciate the feedback as we try to revamp it. So I see a question um, that says, if more than a building has more than one POI, how is that match, how is that match done? And, and that, that's really um, when you take the metadata so that you really need categorization information. But if, if you don't have that, maybe you'd want some process where you get to, you get returned multiple matches. So if you know that the POI you're putting in are multi-tenant buildings and you wanna see every, every um, tenant in that building, maybe you, we could incorporate that into our match service. So we really appreciate feedback as we undergo this process to update the service. Yeah, one thing I'll, I'll add to Alon's comment as well. So uh, if you're already in the SafeGraph community, we recently uh, opened up a new channel called Product Feedback. Uh, it's a little bit wide ranging in the sense that you're, you're welcome to post any sort of feedback, whether it be about our data products or the match service. Uh, if you ever run into bugs on shop, really uh, great way to let our team know and, and uh, give us some visibility as far as like what kinds of things uh, we can improve. So please feel free to drop any uh, product feedback in that channel. Uh, another thing is that whenever people post product po post uh, product feedback, um, the SafeGraph team will also make you a meme. So uh, if that is uh, any incentive, please feel free to share that type of information with us. Um, one other question, uh, so a few other actually. So uh, do you have any advice for dealing with address, uh, you know, sub-premise suite numbers for businesses and strip malls, offices, office buildings, so on and so forth? Um, and then kind of a, a two-parter. So similar to the city slash suburb names, I've seen streets have different names, like a local street name. Oh, and a highway name. Any advice for this? Yeah. Um, so I guess the advice would be, okay, so when it comes to the suite numbers, I, I think you're, you're going to need either to return all matches and go through manually or have some sort of um, property categorization, business categorization. Um, when it comes to the street names being completely different, you can play around with your join keys. And so every time I get a new data set, I might change the procedure just a little bit. So an example would be, if you notice that two places could have different street addresses, maybe you omit that from your join when you're doing the initial join to get all possible matches. So instead of saying street name has to match, maybe you just say, the POI name has to be within a certain Levenstein distance. So I would probably recommend if you have the location name, you drop the street name component, you still want to match on postal code because you want to limit how many possible matches you have. And then you say in this postal code, we want to take all POI that have a Levenstein distance location name within a certain threshold. You're probably going to have to play around with it. Maybe it's six to 10, something similar to what we use for the street, um, street name. That would probably be how I recommend dealing with um, inconsistent streets. Got it. Um, yeah, uh, so to answer Tobias's question, more than happy to share the slide deck. Uh, if anybody's interested, we can circulate that around. So certainly feel free to reach out. Um, kind of a follow up to the previous one about, um, you know, a building with more than one POI. So in terms of visits in a building with a coffee shop and a hospital, for instance, even if the matches are assigned to both locations, uh, there, uh, you know, is there is there no way to determine which visits are visiting which establishments? So, um, I would recommend, and we can share this as well. The visits, uh, our patterns visits white paper. So we actually, if the building, if the POI, if we have information on both POI in the same building, and they're not enclosed, so it's not an indoor mall, we do assign visits to these locations, um, and this is based on different algorithms that look at the time of day. So if one of the, if it's a coffee shop, we might say, okay, maybe more, there's gonna be more visits in the morning. Um, and that's kind of detailed in the visits white paper. Um, it's, is the case so that if two POI are co-located or located very close to each other, one POI might cannibalize another POI's visits. Um, and so that can happen and we, um, Nikki mentioned the product feedback. So if that ever happens, please let us know and we can determine what's going on. Sometimes the recommendation is you just, if you're interested in the trends that that one 
POI, you might have to look at all of the tenants that are co-located. But with our visits attribution, we try our best to, with some machine learning um, attribute visits to their correct POI if they're located very close to one another. Awesome. Just shared the uh, white paper that Alon had uh, referenced in the chat as well. So um, I think for that is all the questions that we had uh, coming in. Um, again, SafeGraph team is always available. Uh, we're always here for you in the community. Please post any other questions that you might have um, as you think of them, or if anybody is watching this recording offline, feel free to reach out over our help channel in the SafeGraph community. But um, like I said, we'll, we'll be hosting a handful of other events in the coming weeks. We'd love uh, for everybody to come back out. Um, be sure to sign up as well uh, for any events, even if you can't make it so that we can circulate the recording around. But um, until then, we will talk to everyone soon and have a great rest of the day. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.